Hi, am I on? No? Does it sound like it? Okay, I have a naturally loud voice, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, so good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Shanice Saunders. Like I said, I'm originally from St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands, and I've been at Uchi Pines for a little over 10 years. Can you believe it? I know, time goes really fast when you're having fun, they say. Um, something that I want to encourage you, though, is that over the last 10 years, you see a lot. You know, and it's amazing what God can do when we pay attention to what he's asked us to do. You know, when we're obedient to what he's called us to, his biddings are, do you know that quote? His biddings are enablings. So if God asks us to do anything, does that mean that it's too difficult or impossible? No, it's not. So before we go any further... I'm going to pray, and then we'll start, okay? Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for today, and we're grateful for the blessing of life, and I just ask that you will be with us, and that you will bless, and that your angels will join us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so how many of you have or know of someone that has diabetes, or a family member, or... Yeah, the vast majority of people. How many of you have never heard of the word diabetes? Unfortunately, it's a really common thing, right? So if you had to put diabetes, the definition, in your own words, what would you say? What would you say? Unless nobody knows what diabetes is. High blood sugar. Perfect. High or low blood sugar. Okay. All right. So we'll see. We'll see, right? Uh, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. And it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, does God only have a plan for us physically? No, right? Like uh, Jai was saying this morning in the sermon, it's a whole package, right? So it's physically, spiritually, emotionally, and socially, right? So God, he has a plan for us. So like I was asking before, what is diabetes? So diabetes is a group of diseases which involves the organ, called the pancreas, and a hormone called insulin. And of course, we'll talk a little bit more about those things as we go on. But like we know, there's type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes. So is there anyone that knows the difference between type 1, type 2, and gestational diabetes? Type 1, let's start with that. What is type 1 diabetes? So, when, huh? Yeah. It's usually juvenile onset. You don't produce any insulin. So, many times in type 1 diabetes, they tend to be diagnosed in childhood. But if your type 2 diabetes gets bad enough, it can transition over to type 1 diabetes. So, at that point, your pancreas is shot, right? It's not producing any insulin or very, very little. So is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? That's a really, really bad thing. Now, what, what happens in type 2 diabetes? There's insulin resistance or the pancreas is producing very little insulin. And then low insulin, yes. And then also now we have our gestational diabetes. And the name kind of gives, gives it away. What's gestational diabetes? During when you are pregnant. Well, that goes only for the ladies, right? All right. So the pancreas, of course, release, releases different hormones, but the one we're going to focus on is insulin. So it releases insulin, among others, for digestion and absorption of the nutrients. But what is the main important function of insulin? So here it says insulin is important 
and allowing our cells to take in glucose for it to be used as energy. And it's important for fat metabolism and homeostasis. And homeostasis is just a big word for balance. Now, if we, we like to liken um, insulin to a key, right? So remember we said that we have glucose and what is the function of glucose for the body? Right, so glucose is for energy. So like we had a really, really, really good lunch, right? And so all the food that we just ate, some parts of it is gonna break down into glucose. Now if the glucose just stays in the bloodstream, is that a problem? Yeah, because it needs to get inside of the cell. And that's where insulin comes in, right? So you can see those little keys on the, the left-hand side. So if you could see number one, it says insulin lets the glucose get into the cell. So you see there's a key and there's like a keyhole to try to give you the depiction or the idea. And so the insulin goes in, it affects whatever receptors that it needs to on the cell itself. And then now the glucose is into the cell. So remember, we have in type 1 diabetes, the pancreas is doing what? It's not producing insulin. In type 2 diabetes, the insulin is either low or the body is resistant to the insulin, right? Uh, from the Mayo Clinic, they ask, they say, what is the best diet for diabetics? So not just coming from Shanice or from UG Pines, let's see what they have to say. A diabetes diet is a healthy eating plan that's naturally rich in nutrients and low in fat and calories. The key elements are fruits, vegetables, and whole grain. In fact, a diabetes diet is the best eating plan for everyone. Yeah, as I was reading, I was like, okay, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, that kind of sounds of, about like what Grace was talking about this morning in her nutrition part, right? So not just for diabetics, but for all of us, right? So there's a song, it's found in Ministry of Healing, I think page 296, and it goes like this. Fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables constitutes the diet chosen for us by our creator ministry of healing 296 you think you can do that let's try it again fruits nuts grains and vegetables constitutes the diet chosen for us by our creator ministry of healing 296 i just did two solos so one more time. So fruit is really easy. Fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables constitutes the diet chosen for us by our creator. Ministry of Healing, page 296. You want to try it one more time? Okay. Fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables constitutes the diet chosen for us by our creator. Ministry of Healing 296. Good job. You know, whoever is the deacon, take note because each one of these people can do special music. They just proved it to you. So fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables constitutes the diet chosen for us by our Creator. And that is found, like I said, in Ministry of Healing, and it was written hundreds of years ago, at least 150 years ago, right? So God knew. So what are some of the signs and symptoms. And I know they might seem like big words, but to be honest, they're really simple. So one sign is polyuria, which just means excessive urination. So you need to go to the bathroom to urinate frequently. Polydipsia, which means excessive thirst. So you're really thirsty. Polyphagia, excessive hunger, and weight loss. Some other symptoms that you might experience is blurry vision, um, numbness and tingling 
in your lower extremities, so your hands and your feet, impotence, yeast infections, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that you recognize with diabetes is that it not only just, it's not just your blood sugar alone. Yes, your blood sugar is affected, but it starts to affect different parts of your body. Hence, you can see with the symptoms. And it damages the kidneys, the heart, the eyes, right? So it starts to wreak havoc on just different parts of the body. So what is considered, or actually how is diabetes diagnosed? Like if you were to go to the doctor, what is the protocol, so to speak, that they would follow to diagnose you with diabetes? So you can see there, there's one way where they'll check your blood sugar. I'm sure everybody have had it, right? So they take an alcohol swab and they clean your finger and then all of a sudden what's next? Oh, that needle that hurts a lot. And then they take a gauze to wipe off the first drop and then they check your blood sugar. But to give you a diagnosis, they won't do it one time. They will do it at least twice. And if your blood sugar is greater than 125, two times, they will give you a diagnosis of diabetes, or also they will do the oral glucose tolerance test, and the test is exactly what the name says. So they would give you something to drink, and I believe in about two hours, they will check your blood sugar levels, and if your blood sugar levels are higher than 200, based on that test, then they're like, okay, by now, your blood sugar should have come down, and it hasn't. So it's a high likelihood that you have diabetes. Now, the other way that they would check um, might be one of the most popular ways is to check your hemoglobin A1C, right? And if your hemoglobin A1C is greater than 6.5, they diagnose you with diabetes. Now, with the hemoglobin A1C, our red blood cells have an average lifespan of how many days? 120 days, right? Before it's destroyed and we have new red blood cells being made. And so as the red blood cells circulate in the bloodstream, glucose attaches itself, you know, to the red blood cells. And so when they test your blood, that's what they're looking at. Okay, so the hemoglobin A1C is an average of your blood sugar over the last three months, right? Or a hundred and a little bit more. Three months is like what? 90 days, a little bit more than three months, right? So you might be able to cheat the, the glucose test, the first one, by being good for the week before or the two days before. Like, you know, okay, I'm not gonna eat any of that cake that was like on Daniel's table in the children's story or I might not eat certain things. So when I go to my doctor, those numbers will look good, but you can't cheat the A1C because it's been for how long? A little over three months, right? So that's a really good indicator. And you can see with the arrows on the left-hand side, um, so according to this scale, they have less than 100 as normal, pre-diabetes between 100 to 125, and 126 or more, as diabetes. But at UC Pines, we give it, we shift the scale a little bit. So for us, the ideal range is 60 to 90 for a normal blood sugar. And then we try to keep it below 90 because what we've seen is that many times, even though according to this, 100 to 100 and, no, less than 100 is normal. So even between 90 and 100 might seem okay. Many times we see when people are running in that range, they're slowly walking towards prediabetes. So we found that it's just better to keep people away from the edge. Because as humans, we kind of have this thing. You know, if you tell a kid, don't touch it, they're like, I'm not touching it. You know? So you just kind of scoot away from the edge a little bit, right? And then also what you see here, I think the podium might be blocking it, but it's just the idea of depending on your hemoglobin A1C, what your average blood sugar would be. So let's say, God forbid, that you have an A1C, remember, it's the average of your blood sugar for the last three months, 
is at 10.0, where might your blood sugar have been? How high? 275. Even to, for the normal range, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a really bad thing, right? And believe it or not, people actually make it there to those numbers. And this is pretty much what I was explaining to you. As the time goes on, the glucose or the sugar molecule sticks to the red blood cells. So the more glucose that you intake, the more sugar there is to be on your red blood cell. Okay? Now, impact in the U.S. that diabetes has. So it says more than 34 million Americans have diabetes. So that's about 1 in 10. Right? So let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Sorry, you have diabetes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Sorry, sir. That's two people. 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Jai. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So at least in this room, at least three people would have diabetes. But to be honest, there's probably more, you know? And then it says approximately 90 to 95% of them have type 2 diabetes, and it's the seventh leading cause of death in the United States, although it is underreported. And many times, people don't even know that they are diabetic or even on the edge. I remember um, a few years ago, maybe, I'm not that old, but maybe my early 20s, I, I went to the doctor and I had a, a blood test done, and usually my blood test is really good. Maybe I need to have some more vitamin D. That's usually the issue, right? But this time, what do you think happened? <laughs> yeah, they were saying that I was pre-diabetic. I said, like, what happened? You know, I'm vegan. Why am I pre-diabetic? What, what do you think the cause was? Stress, mm, that's possible. Uh-huh, suffer. <laughs> Anything else? Can you be vegan and diabetic? Yes. Yeah, let's not pretend, you know? <laughs> Were you really? <laughs> yeah, the choices. Yeah, exactly, the choices that you were making. And you know, to be honest, around that time frame, I think my parents had just bought me my car. So guess what I was doing less of? Walking, right? So my insulin started to go up, <laughs> my A1C went up, and now Shanice, the vegan, is pre-diabetic. But then, what do you do? You have the tools in your hands, so what do you do? You make changes, and now I'm not, thank God, right? So even if many times, let's say, you're in your early 20s and you're pre-diabetic, where do you think you'll be by 40? Yeah, you might be a full-blown diabetic by then, maybe even by 30, you know? So we can't just say, oh, they're young, let them eat whatever they want. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We have to make good choices now, today. So like we were saying with the pre-diabetes, it's a serious health condition where blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but not high enough to be diagnosed as type 2 diabetes. Approximately 88 million American adults more than one in three have prediabetes. So if I had to go through that count again, the majority of us would have prediabetes. And that's a problem. And sometimes we don't really think of it as much as a problem because it's just like, oh, it's just pre. If somebody says you have precancerous cells, how do you feel? Do you feel good about it? No. I think we might more freak out if they say we have precancerous cells. But when they say prediabetes, like, oh, it's okay, I don't really have diabetes. But no, you're on your way there, right? And so the goal is to, to stay away from the edge as much as possible. Now, how much money do you think this disease is having or is having an impact on the US? So here it says 327 billion in medical cost a year. I can't even comprehend, like, it's like, you know what you can do with that money? A lot. But we're spending it on for diabetes. 
So it's two times as high as people without diabetes. So they're saying the diabetics, they um, pay more money in their health care. And so what are some of the physical impacts? So personal monetary costs, of course, because sometimes for the center, we have to pay for those test strips. And do you think they're cheap? No, they're not. The glucometer is cheaper than those test strips. And so you have to pay for those test strips, the glucometer, and then your frequent trips to the doctor because diabetes is more than just high blood sugars. That's not the only thing it's affecting. It's affecting other things, the kidneys, like we said, the heart, the eyes, okay? And yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you can see there the nerves, it causes amputations. So it causes a lot of, a lot of issues. <laughs> Some more impacts of diabetes, sleeplessness, fatigue, mental fog, depression, and anxiety. So how many of you would love to go through your day-to-day -day like that? If you want to, just raise your hand. No, right? No. So how, how can we change that? What can we do different? Huh? Eat differently. Eat differently. There's so much. I think if you were to apply everything that you learned this morning from N to T, from the new start, you might be ahead of a lot of people. It's so simple, but it's so helpful. So a BMI or a body mass index greater than 25, so you're considered overweight. So you know what the BMI they have, okay, if you are five foot one and you are 120 pounds, there's a scale. So that might be considered normal. But if I was 130 pounds, they might say I'm overweight versus somebody that's five foot 10, them being at 130, they might be considered underweight. So that's how the scale kind of goes. And obesity greater than 30, a BMI, are the strongest risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Now, why do you think that's the case, that obesity is a strong risk factor for diabetes? The visceral fat. And then remember, we talked about the insulin resistance. So we have the, let's pretend this is a cell. And then remember, we said insulin is kind of like a what? A key. But if you have something, fat that is surrounding the, the red blood cell and it's making it more difficult, it's hard enough for the key to get through without that fat. With the additional fat, it's going to make it even more difficult. But when we're helping and teaching other people, we have to be sensitive, right? Because obesity and overweight, it's a, it's a touchy subject. So it's not only just looking at the person's weight and saying, oh, you're overweight. It's like, no, trying to understand how did we get to where we are today? It's not so much the weight, but what are some of the choices that we're making on a day-to-day -day basis that gets me to this point? So maybe it's just ignorance, right? Dietary choices. Maybe it's because they're depressed, so they turn to food. So, right, we can put them on a diet plan, but if we don't address the emotional needs, then we've kind of missed the boat, right? So it's a whole picture. According to the World Health Organization, interventions that promote healthy diet, physical activity, and weight loss can prevent type 2 diabetes in people at high risk. And who are the people at high risk? Many times, the obese, and also when we're making not the best choices in our dietary habits. So healthy diet, is that too expensive? Tell me the truth, what do you think? A healthy diet. Depending, if you get, go to, um, what's that place? The Whole Food Market? That might be kinda expensive, but unless you grow your own, that might be cheaper. What about physical activity, is that expensive? No, we don't really want to do it, but it's not expensive. And weight loss, is that expensive? No, so it doesn't really cost us much in comparison. So if we have to think about how much is it costing me to buy or to make healthier choices versus one night in the ER, which one do you think is more expensive? One night in the ER, that's right. So Dean Ornish, he says, think about it, heart disease and diabetes, which account for more deaths in the US and worldwide than everything else combined, are completely preventable by making 
comprehensive lifestyle changes without drugs or surgery. So I would hate for something to take me out that was preventable. You know? If I was to die from something, hopefully it's something that I couldn't prevent. You know? Knowing that now I started making better choices. So when it comes to a diabetic, like we saw earlier, fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables constitutes the diet chosen for us by our creator, Ministry of Healing, page 296. So a plant-based diet, high in fiber, and low in fats, right? We saw that in, I think it was from the Mayo Clinic. So we're going to take more of a look at that. So for all of us, we should try to um, make better choices, but this is specifically for diabetics. So trying to avoid the refined carbs. So if you had to choose, right, if you had to choose between whole wheat pasta and the regular white pasta in the blue box, which one is better for you? The, which one tastes better? The white one in the box, right? I know, I know. I understand that completely. <laughs> you get used to it, exactly. Huh? The whole wheat tastes good. You know what I really like? The brown rice pasta, too. It's kind of like a happy medium. But one of the things with diabetics, if we eat something that is more refined, the more refined the thing is, the more quickly our blood sugar does what? Bing! Shoots up. That's right. Because now we don't have the fiber in it to slow down the process. So, like, for instance, if you were to drink something really sugary, your blood sugar is going to spike more quickly than if I was to eat an apple, for instance. Because we have the fiber, it's being digested more slowly, it's not just spiking, right? Also, trying to avoid things like high fructose corn syrups. And avoid, yes, sir? All the canned food. All the canned food, uh huh. All the canned foods are the type of foods that will bring diabetes. Yes. Mm, okay. The chem and that we have to pay attention to our labels, right? We have to pay attention. We don't just go in Publix or Walmart and just walk and just put it in our cart. Yeah. Canned beans. Well, I think you have to look at the ingredients. Like you know, sometimes when you, I'll just use Walmart because that's where I go many times. When you look at the back of the 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 organic one, sometimes it's just water salt and beans but some other ones there's a bunch of other things sugar chemicals all in it so you need to pay attention to what you're buying and also the trans saturated fat many times saturated fat is found in our meats and stuff and we're talking about the more oils and cholesterol and fats that we intake the higher our insulin resistance i see a hand in the back Gluten free? Celiac disease? Okay. Uh huh. Okay. So you're asking if somebody is diabetic and has celiac disease at the same time? How? Well, I think if they're not able to eat, um, what do you call those things? Gluten, for instance, because it affects them. God is so good. You know why? Because he puts fiber in lots of things, right? They might not be able to eat whole wheat bread, but I'm sure they can eat celery, you know, or cucumber, or uh, apple, or you know what I mean? Or they might not be able to eat whole wheat, but they might have amaranth or millet or, you know? And so God, he's, he's always provided for us. This is a really good question. I see one more hand, then I'll go on. Okay, so avoiding the saturated fats, so that many times comes from our, the meats, plant foods don't have saturated fat, the only plant food I believe that does is coconut, okay, like coconut oil and stuff like that, so if you are diabetic, you want to be careful, okay, and then the trans fat, 
many times they're found in our packaged food and trans fat is when they take the oil from a liquid state and put it into a more solid state. So like our margarine, margarine, sorry, my accent kicked in there, or butter or something, you know, that um, makes the oil more solid. So if I, as a diabetic, you're already struggling, so you'd want to avoid, reduce, or eliminate some of those things, okay? Exercise. Exercise is a giving. It, here it says working out is never convenient, but neither is illness, diabetes, and obesity. Yeah. <laughs> Exercise increases the uptake of glucose into the cells and makes the cells more sensitive to insulin. So one of the things that we encourage the guests at Uchi Pines to do is after breakfast and after lunch and after supper, where do you think we send them? Outside. Go for a walk because your pancreas is either not producing enough or any at all, but when you exercise, you're using up the excess glucose for energy, right? Because if you just sit after lunch, it doesn't take a whole lot of energy to listen to me, unless I'm boring, then you have to try to keep yourself awake. But when it comes to being active and walking, you're using up that excess glucose. So it's an extra benefit for you. So not just those of us that are diabetics, but even those of us that are not, that would be a good habit to incorporate. And I know we work or we have jobs or whatever, so just like five, 10 minutes, and you don't have to jog, it's usually more of a light walk because you just ate. So here, at least 30 minutes a day, including cardio and resistance training. So weights, walking, jogging, depending on your ability. But what if you see Shanice? Guess what? It's a bummer. I use a walker and I, I can't move much. What can you do? Chair exercises. So my philosophy is, if you can just move this finger, move it, yeah? So you do the best that you can do in the situation that you are in. Now, water. So water, drinking water is preventative and protective overall. It helps to regulate the food intake, and of course, it does not increase your blood sugar, right? If you could count on one drink, to not increase your blood sugar, it would be what? Water. And I think, like one of our friends was saying, I think it was Miss Kathy, many times people don't like the taste of water. Yes, sir. What happens is that we eat and drink. Mm -hmm. That's another area because we want them all the vitamins pertaining to the fortification of the whole. Mm. When we drink I know that's a hard one, but you're right. It's a hard one. He's saying that when you drink and eat, um, actually what it does is just dilutes the hydrochloric acid. And so your food should, it doesn't digest the way that it should. And it slows down the digestion. But we like to do it, you know? So we have to ask God to help us and pray. <laughs> and um, at some point, don't let me forget, we're going to talk about a treatment that we can do, or maybe I should just do it now, of what we can do to help with diabetes. So, do I tell it? No, it's okay. Okay, so when she comes back, we'll talk about the hydrotherapy treatment that we can do to help with diabetes, not to hold you guys up too long. Now, sunlight, this morning we're talking about sunlight a little bit. Sunlight has insulin-like effect. It increases the storage of blood glucose and decreases the blood sugar overall. So one of the ways that it helps, like we were saying this morning, when sun hits the skin, right? It hits the skin, and it helps to convert the cholesterol. So I think it was the 7-D hydrocholesterol, something like that. And it helps to convert that, that cholesterol, into vitamin D. And it's a double whammy if you think about it, because if we're sunbathing and it's converting the excess um, cholesterol into vitamin D, it's also helping us with our insulin resistance because it's using up the excess cholesterol. Isn't that amazing? So getting out into the sunshine, um, but of course, according to your skin complexion, no burning, okay? So that's sunlight. Temperance, moderation, and self-control. Eating in moderation 
and self-control decreases the risk. Abstinence and elimination of refined sugars and greens, no sugary and alcoholic beverages, no caffeine or nicotine, right? So temperance, I believe, is at the foundation of many, if not all, diseases, right? So we might be like, I'll just use us for example. We might be good at eating well, but we work a lot, so we don't get enough sleep. Is that a problem? It is a problem, you know? Or let's say we might drink a lot of water, but we live in the middle of Times Square in New York, and we don't get fresh air. Is that a problem? Yeah, so we have to ask God to help us. Okay, how can I bring myself into a position that's conducive to the best health as possible. Speaking of air, exercising outdoors can help to burn more fat and better glucose control, and breathing clean, fresh air can reduce the risk of diabetes. So I think it, it's just like an all-in-one package, pretty much. Now rest. How many of you sleep eight hours at night? Oh boy. Kinda, I know. So maybe tonight we're gonna try better, but with daylight savings, we might get in trouble, huh? <laughs> but rest is so, so important. Here we can see lack of sleep can result in increased cortisol and inflammation. And of course, we know that the body needs rest to maintain balance or homeostasis. And when the cortisol level, what do we need cortisol levels for? For stress right, in stressful situations. But if you're not getting enough sleep and your cortisol levels are high and then your glucose levels are high, because like if you're in a stressful situation, like if a lion walks through that door, I'm gonna need all the glucose, all the cortisol that I'll need to run away, right? But if you're putting yourself in a consistently stressful situation, so your glucose levels are being affected all the time, what are we going to do? We need to get more. We need to get more sleep. So mental unrest also can increase hormones like cortisol, which increases our blood glucose. And then with the increased blood glucose, we also have increased insulin resistance. So in a way, it's kind of like a, a vicious cycle, right? So what are some ways that we can get to sleep? Now be honest. Think about your life. Think, okay, what can, what can I do? I'll start with me, Shanice. What can I do to get more sleep? Maybe put my phone away? Or do a little less work, like don't come home with work? Okay, try going to bed at the same time. And my friend said, turn your mind off. So you know, it, what tends to keep us up at night? Many times is the things that we can change. Because if we could have changed it, we would before we went to bed. So we tend to worry about the bills and the kids and the person that's sleeping right next to us, you know? But if you think about it, if you didn't have the money before you went to bed, do you think, worrying about it, the money is gonna appear? Ding. No, no, right? So when, when we look at it, it's kind of comical, right? It's like, why do we even worry? Nothing even changes. The kids still gonna do whatever they wanna do. The bills, you still don't have the money for it right now, so you might as well just wait for God to <laughs> um, help you out. <laughs> and the person that's sleeping right next to you, he probably didn't throw out the trash, and he's not going to do it now. So, you know, it's just, <laughs> it is what it is. You can't really change anything. So, um, let's see, real quick, let's do the hydro one. So, one of the things with hydrotherapy, God has provided simple things for us to help us out. So remember, where is our pancreas? Yeah. So, so where, what's here? <laughs> our liver. And our pancreas is over on this side. Never forget, okay? Your left side. So we have this treatment. We call it the fomentations. Fomentations is pretty much, it's like a hot pack, if you had to put it really simple. And uh, what the goal is, is to try to help stimulate the function of the pancreas, so to increase blood flow to that area. So what you do, now if you were to pretend that this was a bare 
add them in here. And then we have these towels. These are incredible towels. You should not get burnt through this. Huh. So you have the towels and you fold it in three or you fold it in four. If you fold it in four, it's kind of like this. You just take the towel and you fold it in four and you put the towel over your abdomen. What is this layer for? Protection. Because if you put a hot pad on a bare belly, that's a recipe for disaster. Burn. That's right. So pretend that you have this um, towel on your abdomen. Now we need a hot towel. So what we're going to do, there's different ways to get this towel wet. right? So you either wet it and wring it out, but looking at the plushness of this towel, it will be very wet. So you can put it in the washing machine on the rinse spin cycle, and it would rinse and then spin it out for you, and it will be nice and wet but dry, if that makes sense. And then you fold the, you dip the, either put it in a microwave. So you put it in the microwave. <laughs> you put it in a microwave in a, a plastic bag that won't melt. And then we heat it up for about three to six minutes, right? And then we put that on top of the dry towel. Or you can um, take this same towel and if it's not this big, dip it in hot water, in a pot of hot water, and then wring it out. Just don't get burnt. So if you're going to dip it in hot water, you keep the edge out of the water. So this part, and you dip it in the hot water and wring it out. And then you can use it. Or remember, the towel still always needs to be wet because it's moist heat. Or you can roll it up. It's folded in four. Roll it up and put it in the oven wet and it will be warm. Any other ways to warm it up? I think the microwave, the, yeah, but the microwave is the easiest way. You use the stove. Uh-huh. I see your hand back there. Uh-huh. A hand towel. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. Blanket. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, so that's the chest one. So pretty much the easiest way, honestly, is just the microwave. So get it wet, wring it out, and fold it in four or in three, roll it up like this, and we put it in a bag. We put it in the microwave to heat up, so three to six minutes, and it's really hot. So then imagine you had the towel over the abdomen, the dry one. This is the wet, hot one, and you put it on. And then we put another towel on top to keep the heat in. Yeah. <laughs> so, so pretend this is her abdomen. You got this? So this is the dry one. And then pretend this is the wet, hot one in between. And then there is a dry one on top and the blanket over. OK? So you can imagine that. Thank you. Oh, God. oh yeah. So you're going to do three to five exchanges actually five to seven exchanges <laughs> oh okay so after the fermentations are on right they're on for three minutes and then you do 30 seconds cold and then you dry it off and then you put the towel back on again okay so the towel is on this is all the heat and everything on and then okay three minutes is up the timer goes beep 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 then you take it off, and then we do a cold friction over the pancreas. So here, we do a cold friction, and then we get a dry towel and dry her off, because if you don't dry her off, she's going to get burnt. And then we do the heat again for three minutes. So it's three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold, five exchanges. OK? 
Okay? And if anything, I can write it down for you later. And Rukia did bring a bag. Okay, I can show you. Sorry, you guys. So this is the fomentation that you're going to heat up. It's just different ways to do it, so I won't get complicated. This, this is just one. And you just put it to heat up. Some of them, they like to leave it open in the bag. Right? If you leave it open in the bag, technically, you can just roll this up. And it never has to come out of the bag. You know, you just lay it on top. So there's different ways. The point is have a hot, wet towel. Don't burn them. Three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold, five exchanges, five to seven exchanges. Okay? And that treatment takes about 30, 40 minutes. And it's really helpful. Are you talking about compress? The fermentations. Yeah, the, the hot compress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the hydro part. Then, of course, like we were saying, trust in God. We can't really truly rest if we don't have trust in God. Um, like Jai, I think, was saying earlier today, like we can do the herbs, we can do the hydro, but without God, we can't really, we can't do anything, to be honest. And we're doing all of it in our own, our own strength. Trust in his means to prevent disease. And I think this is from Exodus. And it says, and if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And when you think about the Egyptians, if you were to go back, there was a study that was done, and they took a look at the Egyptians, and the Egyptians looked a lot like today, the diseases that they suffered with. So they had diabetes, they had heart disease, they had cancer and kidney disease. So if we were supposed to go according to that Bible verse, what are we not doing? We're not listening. We don't, we don't use the word hearken anymore, but we're not listening and we're not obeying. Right? His words are yea and amen. The next thing is reasoning from cause to effect. What is the reason for your diabetes? You know, some people might say, I, diabetes runs in my family. But many times it might be because no one in our family runs, right? So we picked up the same habits, right? And it's funny, little things. Like, I'll give you an example. Growing up, you know, you watch your parents go to the grocery store. So I remember what my parents would buy. They would buy some Uncle Ben's rice, a bag of potatoes, six cans of little tomato sauce, some tofu, and two cartons of milk. Now that I'm older and I have to go grocery shopping, what do you think I do? I go buy a bag of Uncle Ben's rice, six cans of tomato sauce, and I live by myself. And I had a family of six. And it's just funny how the, the things that your parents did, you do the same thing. The way they season your jerk chicken, the same that you do yours today, right? And so we're like, yeah, it, the disease just runs in my family. So well, in reality, exactly, the dietary choices, right? And so we can't use that as an excuse because we can, we can say that this trend and this trajectory stops with me, right? And in Proverbs 26, verse 2, it says, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse caused us shall not come. You know, sometimes when you're researching, you're trying to figure out what is the cause for this thing. And sometimes, what do they say? There's no cause. It's idiopathic. Right? But there is a cause. We just don't know. Right? But we need to figure out what is the cause. What are some of the choices that I'm making? So, we talked a little bit about the nutrition aspect of a plant-based, of a diabetic diet. Um, making sure that we have a strict plant-based diet, reducing or avoiding things that are rich in cholesterol and fats. And if we think about it, plant foods don't have cholesterol in it. The only thing that has cholesterol are things that have a face. One of the major, I think I is eating 
Ooh, he's coming for us. You hear what he said? <laughs> he said he said that we're sleeping too late, we're eating too late, and then we're going to sleep. Is that a problem? It is a problem. Because after after your normal supper time, let's say around six, six thirty, late is seven o'clock, if you were to go to bed immediately, what do you think happens to our metabolism? At night when you're sleeping, is your metabolism speeding up or slowing down? slowing down. So your glucose usage is not as strong or as active as it would be during the day. So if it's not as active as it was during the day, and then you have high blood sugar issues on top of that, it's like you're creating a recipe for disaster. So if you are eating supper at night, for all of us, not just diabetics, it's better to eat it sooner rather than later. And I know sometimes it might take a little practice, but you can do it. You can do it. So this might be a little different. Um, no, having snacks in between your meals. So many times for diabetics, how many meals do they encourage you to eat a day? 40? Five to six. Yeah, they encourage you to eat five to six small meals a day. Do you know why they tell you to do that? So they told you to do it, and you don't know why. Yeah, so what they're doing is that they're covering their bases because of the hypoglycemic medication or the medication that they're using to lower your blood sugar, right? So they have to keep you safe, right? So because you're taking the insulin and because you're taking the oral medication, like metformin, for instance, they have to keep you from crashing, right? But is it possible to be diabetic and not be eating all the time? It's possible. We see it every single session, right? The guests, they come in on we might give them two meals, three meals the max, breakfast, lunch, and supper, depending on their situation. But most of the time, it's a breakfast and lunch, and then that's it. The next morning, they're okay, right? And sometimes it sounds like an absurd thought. Like, you mean to tell me that I'm going to only eat two to three meals a day. Is that possible? It is. If you eat a sufficient breakfast, like, you know, that saying, breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen or prince, <laughs> and supper like a pauper. How do paupers eat? They might not. Oh, they might not, or they might have very little, right? Because like we said, in the evening time, the metabolism slows down. So if it's possible to try to avoid, uh, avoid having a late supper, if you decide, okay, I'm going to eat supper, it's going to be on the lighter side, like fruits, grains, you know, not like a heavy rice and bean, like, you know, to go and lay down. And many times what we've seen is that we have them eat breakfast, they eat lunch, and we say, I'll encourage you, of course everybody has a choice, to try and hold off on the second, on the third meal. And we'll see what your blood sugar is in the morning. And many times their blood sugar levels are a lot better. But sometimes, like I might be in the kitchen at the center, and I see a guest face, and they say, Shanice, can I have some supper? I, and you know, I'm big into having people make their own choice. And I ask them, what did your doctor tell you? Well, they told me to eat two meals, but you made smoothies tonight, I wanna try. Okay, go ahead, <laughs> try, try and see, and we'll see. I have to check your blood sugar in the morning anyway, so if that's a decision that you want to make after your doctor talks to you and your counselor talks to you, there's the food. Then they go, and they're, they might be happy. Then in the morning at 6 o'clock, I have to check their vitals. And I check. It goes, beep, 140. When the day before, it was 80. And I ask them, so, did he eat supper last night? Yeah. And many times, some people, that's the only way they're going to learn. If they were to see it, for themselves and to be honest I'm okay with it you know if if you're going to get it if by me just telling it to you you're not going to understand you're like okay let me see for myself and you notice a difference now there's some people um, because of the medications that they're on they're not able to skip the last meal and that's okay right but instead of eating a huge sandwich or whatever they eat light they might eat just a few fruits or something to carry them over so that their blood sugar doesn't drop too low 
right? But the goal is to not overdo it and to follow principles, you know? And also, something that we do as well, but this one has to be supervised, is fasting, right? Of course, if the person is fasting, they're not taking their medication. They're not taking the insulin, they're not taking their metformin, right? So if they're fasting, they're not doing what? They're not taking their insulin, they're not taking their metformin, why? It's gonna drop it even more, they're gonna kill themselves, right? Because if you're not eating anything, your blood sugar is gonna be low. And what is the action of insulin and metformin? It's to make it go lower, and that's not what we need because you're fasting. But they fast under the supervision of the physicians, and many times it makes, it helps the pancreas to give it a break and to be more responsive to the insulin. But if you decide to go on two meals, that's kind of a fast, too. And something that might be helpful is if you eat breakfast, like, let's say, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, the latest, and then you have supper or lunch by 2, 3 o'clock, then you'll be okay. Like, you won't feel as hungry, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> now, it says the people who eat the most animal protein have the most heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. T. colon Campbell. So what are some things that we can incorporate into our diet? Things like soy, string beans, celery, fenugreek, fennel, lemon, barley. And we'll talk a little bit more about those things. Be mindful of the foods that you eat, especially the fruits, is have things on a lower glycemic index. That's just a fancy way to say the foods that are less sweet, right? So if you had to choose between a watermelon, I was surprised about that. The glycemic index of a watermelon on a scale from 1 to 100, 100 being like the sweetest thing that you've ever eaten, is at 72. So a watermelon and a diabetic might not be good friends right now, especially depending on how much you eat. But if you were to eat things like your grapefruits, all your berries, your um, green apples, plums, the things that are lower on the glycemic index, like 40 and below, it will help to keep your, from your blood sugar spiking. It's not saying that you can never eat a banana or never eat watermelon. It's just saying that try and pay attention to those sour fruits, that's what I like to call them, those sour fruits to help keep your blood sugar under control. Blood fruit, one, one a day. One a day, uh-huh. Grapefruit, one a day, you lose weight? Wow, maybe it's because of all the juice in it, you get full fast. Wow, thanks for sharing. Fenugreek. Now, fenugreek, it literally looks like those little seeds right there, and you make a tea out of it. We boil it for about 20 minutes, and it's been shown to decrease overall blood sugar levels, decrease post-meal blood glucose rise, and it's good for type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Also, gymnema sylvester. So gymnema sylvester decreases um, sugar cravings, decreases blood sugar levels, and it helps, and it might, I think that's something they're still looking into, increase the activity and regenerate the cells in the pancreas that help to make insulin. So we have the fenugreek seeds, we have the gymnema sylvester. Um, something else, I don't think it's on this, but I'll just tell you, that is good for blood sugar control is aloe vera. So you take the gel out, and it's about a fourth cup twice a day. There was a study that was done. Um, we were doing some continuing education for a group of physicians, and I was talking to them, and we were looking at this study where they tested some rats, right? And they gave them aloe vera, and I think they were comparing it to metformin, right? The medication that you use to help lower your blood sugar. And it was impressive to see the effect that the aloe vera had on the rats in comparison with the metformin. And the aloe vera gel on the juice did help. So it was really, really incredible, right? You might have to, for a while, you might still be on your medications, but just know that there are things to help. Now, now that I'm thinking about medications, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you just stop your medications, right? That will be really reckless. You have to be supervised. You have to take it step by step and then slowly incorporate it in. Some other things that are good for diabetes is bilberry, blueberry, bitter melon, ginseng, goat's root, and chickweed. And what chickweed does is just suppresses your hunger. 
so you're not eating as much as you probably would. All right. Some other things, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, chromium. I think the max dosage about 800 micrograms. Um, it helps how the body uses or uptakes the glucose. Berberine, magnesium, zinc. All these vitamins are helpful in managing diabetes. And like we talked about, getting in your exercise every day because the exercise uses up the excess glucose. Okay? Of course, drinking water, we talked about the hydrotherapy. Here it says, I can control my diabetes by eating veggies, exercising regularly, and drinking water, but I'm holding out for better options. What are the better options? There's none. Sunshine helps to decrease blood glucose, like we said, increases the cell uptake of glucose, decreases cholesterol, and increases vitamin D at the same time. We talked about temperance, right? Temperance is at the foundation of many lifestyle diseases. It's called lifestyle diseases for a reason because many times the choices that we make on a day-to-day -day basis um, affects us. So avoiding things like caffeine, no smoking or drinking alcohol. And let's see. We talked about the fasting. Be careful with the fasting. If you decide to do it, do it under supervision with your doctor but we have seen it to be very helpful getting as much getting out in the fresh air and exercising getting your daily rest right so we talked about the increase of cortisol with increase of cortisol there's increase of glucose with the increase of glucose your glucose function is already impaired so we want to make sure that we get enough rest at night Um, and then we talked about trusting in God, which is at the foundation of everything. Let's see. So I want to end here pretty much. The last thing I wanted to share with you is with this is a story of this mom and daughter. And I'll call them Jenny and Jennifer. That's probably going to mess you up. But Jenny and Jennifer. So Jenny was young. She was like maybe in her 30s. And she came in with type 1 diabetes. And it was really sad. She's about 32, and she came in with a walker, not a walker, with a cane. And her neuropathy or her the numbness and tingling in her hands and her feet was so bad, like she could hardly walk on it, right? And then, so she was type 1, but then her mother was type 2. So they were both diabetic, just on different spectrums. Jenny, the daughter, by the end of the session, she started, she eventually didn't need her cane anymore because now she had feeling from all the contrast and all the treatments and stuff that she was getting, and definitely with God's help, one of the things that we were excited about is when she started to feel pain again. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Now we're trying to figure out how to deal with this pain that she's having, but she started to feel pain again, and we were ecstatic. Then her mother, her mother came as a companion. She wasn't there really for the treatments. But one day, I was in the office, and the person that's doing the vitals said, hey, Shanice, so... This lady, she isn't really a, a guest, but her blood sugar is running over 200, so somebody needs to see her. It's like, okay, no problem. So she came to the office, and I talked to her, and I was like, okay, she didn't do any fasting or anything. Here are some of the choice, the, the things to do. Try and get more exercise, do some contrast showers, because contrast is good for the neuropathy. It helps with the pain and stuff. And here are some herbs to try. And she was, for the most part, on her own but we were watching her because her blood sugar was so high. And so as the days go by, her blood sugars are dropping and dropping and dropping to the point where she came in at about 211, and with the lifestyle changes that she was making, she was now down to 111. But we were starting to have a problem because she was on insulin <laughs> and she was on medication and all these things. And so it's, the doctors are like, okay, we need to start pulling back because if you continue on this dose of insulin, and with these low blood sugar numbers that you're running now, it's going to create a problem. Your blood sugar is going to go too low. So her medications continue to be cut back, cut back, cut back to a sufficient range. And it was incredible to see what she could do on her own without a whole lot of intervention. Enough intervention to make sure that she's okay, but not to the point of like micromanaging. So it's amazing just know that it's possible. 
it's possible to have a better lifestyle and to improve and to even reverse diabetes, okay? Now with type one diabetes, for sure, you won't be able to fast because your pancreas is shot at that point, but you can lower your blood sugar levels by making better dietary choices, okay? So that's it for right now. Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, you said that you should exercise in the morning after you eat. Why if you can't eat in the morning, you do the exercise before you eat? Okay, that should be fine. But my question is, why can't you eat in the morning? Because I have all the silent gunk and stuff in my throat, and I, I have no appetite, and I have to oh, drink okay. more water and get all that okay. before I eat. Well, that should be fine. Yeah, yeah. you, you work out. You're not hungry? Oh, so we have to work on that sinus thing too then. So you can get you eating in the morning, but. Oh, the sinus is due to the weather. Oh, okay. Now, living in Florida, it depends on the weather and the pollen and all that stuff out there. Yeah. So I've been able to figure out any way to do that naturally. Have you tried the facial contrast? No. Well, that's one way. Any one of us, I think. Yeah. If you see any of these people, they can tell you how to do a facial contrast to help with sinus. Tomorrow? You're doing that tomorrow? Okay. 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 Any other questions? Okay. That means you understood everything I said. That's awesome. Well, you could eat all the good vegetables, but the combination Which combination? Combination. Well, you know, like they said, sugar and salt doesn't work, right? Hmm. Now, you have some vegetables that are very good. You have some fruits that are very good. But the mixture, of, like you said, with watermelon. Watermelon, you can have too much sugar, right? It's a high load, so you might not. You don't want to overdo it. Yes, just a little bit. Mm-hmm. So actually, when we are uh, eating this, these kind of foods, we have to make sure because the only way you're going to make sure your body will tell you something. Your body will tell you what is good for you mm -hmm. and what is not good for you. Yeah. So if your body is talking to you, you better listen. You have to pay attention. And just remember, too, like with a diabetic, it, it might, the goal is to just make it, ha, have this period just be a season, right? We don't, we don't want to have to be super restricted all the time. Like, you know, we want to be able to enjoy the other things, like the bananas and the mango, for instance. But for a season, you might have to cut it out until you can get your blood sugar levels under control, you know? Anybody else? All right. If no more questions, are we praying or are we going straight into you? <laughs> okay. Coconut? Oh, wow.